go ahead and get started. Uh, good morning, everyone, or good evening, or good afternoon, or good middle of the night, wherever you are. We're so happy that you are joining us for this virtual session. I'm sorry that we couldn't be in person, but we're very happy to have the chance to get to speak with you today. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. So let's uh, do that. So again, thank you for coming. This is the Academy of Management Review 2020 Theory Writing Workshop. And we have an exciting program for you today, this morning. We're gonna start off with um, introduction and AMR overview. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about my team and our, our vision, our mission, and what we're going to be doing during our term. And then we have some great uh, facilitators here to talk about publishing an AMR some of the common pitfalls and solutions and how to engage in clear writing. And then the last part of this um, workshop, we're gonna have small group discussions. We have a great set of current and past AMR associate editors and editors who are going to be speaking directly with you in small breakout groups where you can ask any questions or talk through any issues that you might have. Um, I guess I just want to say, I think that the, the chat on the, in the Academy session is open and you can post questions there. Although we may not get to them in our actual speaking sessions, these are things that um, you can address and bring up as you talk in your small groups um, discussion sections later in the morning. So first, our great presentation team. So following me, Cindy Devers, who is an AMR author, past AMR associate editor from Texas A&M, is going to be talking about some of the common pitfalls. We have Mike Farr, also an AMR author, past AMR associate editor from University of Georgia, who will be talking about structuring um, an article. And then finally, Bill Rose Reagans, who of course is an AMR author and our past editor from University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, will, will be giving her time to talk about clear writing. I'd also like to really introduce our small group facilitators. Um, they've been very giving of their time and volunteering to speak with you today. They have a great wealth of knowledge. Um, so very quickly, we have Ruth Aguilera. She's a current AE from Northeastern. Jean Bartunek, she's a past AE from Boston College. John Bundy, I'm a current associate editor from Arizona State. Cindy Devers, who I just mentioned from Texas A&M. And Greg Fisher, a current AE from Indiana University. There's a lot of these, so bear with me. Um, Jay Barney, from an out, the outgoing AMR editor, was gracious enough to give his time this morning um, from University of Utah. We have Abby Shipp, as a current associate editor from Texas Christian University. Rich McAdock, also a current associate editor from Purdue. Shad Morris, a current associate editor from Brigham Young. And Ingrid Fulmer from Rutgers University, and she was a past associate editor. Morella Hernandez, she's a current associate editor from Virginia. Don Lange from Arizona State University is a past associate editor. Joe Mahoney, an outgoing associate editor from University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Joanna Campbell from University of Cincinnati, she's one of my current associate editors. Gary Ballinger from University of Virginia is one of our past associate editors. And the last four that we have today, I've introduced Mike Farr and Bill Rose Reagans but Shelly Brixton, a current associate editor, and Kyle Mayer, also associate editor. Um, Shelly from University of Illinois at Chicago, and Kyle from University of Southern California. So thank you, thank you, thank you to all of you. You'll see them listed on the side of your screen, um, and they will be looking forward to speaking with you later in the session. So I'd like to spend a few moments talking about um, the editorial team, the mission, and the vision. Again, more pictures. I'm not going to reintroduce all the people I already introduced. You'll see their pictures up there, but for the people that haven't been introduced yet, um, Irina Burns, our managing editor, she's the one who gets all of your manuscripts when you send them to her. Um, and Susan Zaid, who's not on this, she's also helped and they've been great with helping put on this virtual session that we have today. John Amos is one of our associate editors. He couldn't be here today from University of Edinburgh and I introduced Abby and John already. So Kyle, Rich, Ruth have been introduced. 
Um, and then Patrick Hawk from University of Lausanne and Donald Conlon from Michigan State were unable to join us, but they are part of the current editorial team. And finally, I have introduced all of these wonderful individuals, Morella, Greg, Shad, Joanna, and Shelley, and they make up the last set of associate editors that are in the current term. So what is our mission? Basically, our mission is very simple. We just want to publish wonderful, great papers that, um, that, that really are thinking outside the box that allow us to publish new theoretical and conceptual insights and that advance our understanding. We want novel, insightful, carefully crafted conceptual articles, and we want you to think very broadly about the world in which these organizations, the people who work in organizations um, exist, and to use those insights as an opportunity to really um, push theory forward. I'd like to talk a little bit about the vision of uh, my team. So we spent a lot of time talking about this. And so the vision for my team over these next three years is the intentional inclusion of diverse voices and global perspectives. Now we've been trying to do this for a while in terms of bringing diverse voices in, bringing global perspectives in, but we thought it really important to focus on the intentional inclusion aspect of it. And so we are going to be making every effort through our engagement efforts, like the one we have here today, and the ones we're going to have in the future to really reach out and try to broaden our community. We also think that a developmental experience, which has been the focus of a lot of um, the past editors and the past work is really important to reaching our vision. Why is that? Why is a developmental approach so important? First of all, it raises the level of scholarship for AMR in the field. We need to encourage our authors rather than deflate them. We need to encourage them to think broadly and boldly. And sometimes it's hard to express that immediately. So you need a little bit of work and encouragement. We also believe that it helps authors push the boundaries. If you're really focusing on everything that's wrong instead of what's right, then it's really hard to be able to articulate what the value is of that, that you're bringing to the table. And finally, it levels the playing field. It promotes the inclusion of diverse voices and those bring new ideas and bold new views. So a little bit on terms of our facts and our stats. Um, we were established in 1976. So that means we're almost 45 years old. Um, we have a circulation of around 16,000. We get approximately 500 submissions a year and we have an acceptance rate between six and 8%. Our impact factor is 8.4 and our five-year impact factor is 12.4. We're published quarterly, uh, January, April, July, and October are the times when our actual issues come out. Although you can see, of course, any manuscripts that are accepted um, and are waiting to be um, published on our website. We have a double blind peer reviewed process and we usually have three reviewers. The, our goal of our team and the teams in the past has been that we will receive, or you will receive um, a first decision 60 days from submission of your manuscript. And we work very hard to try to make sure that happens. In terms of our rankings for the five-year impact factor in management, we're number three in business, we're number six, according to the 2019 journal citation reports. I'd like to spend just a few moments talking more about inclusion and engagement. And this is from your perspective. Um, and then we'll move on to the next part of our, our presenters. We really want you to be a part of AMR. And there's a lot of ways that you can do that. Okay, so we label the four things here, read, educate, review, submit. And let's talk through each of those. If you wanna be part of the community, then of course you need to read the journal. So stay up to date with what has been recently accepted and published. Searching databases doesn't always give you the most up-to-date information, but the website does. So please look at the AMR website um, to see the, the latest things that are being published. Also the AOM journals email alerts does a great job of, of um, publicizing not only what's in AMR journals, but in all Academy of Journals in terms of what has been accepted for publication. We also encourage you to go back and read past theory articles. 
Of course, you should be reading those articles that are related to your topic areas. But what about those highly cited articles outside of your topic areas? It's important to know about the conversations that are going on kind of around the topic areas, not maybe directly. Um, those are really important for you to have a good understanding of as well. The other thing that you could do is read articles that provides different types of theoretical contributions. There's not just one way to write an AMR article. There's not just one way to contribute to theoretical development. So there's articles that actually produce new theory. There's those that challenge existing theory. Some articles synthesize ideas into fresh theory and others, in fact, improve the process of theory development. So explore and get an understanding for what those different types of articles look like. Educate. Educate yourself on theory building and writing. So read AMR articles from the editors, past and current. There are some fabulous, fantastic articles that tell you or help guide you in terms of how should I create a theoretical argument for AMR? What are some of the things I need to think about? What are things that are theory? What are things that are not theory? There's a lot of them out there. Also, participate in our AMR professional development workshops, like this one, right? So we have these every year. We're going to be having more of them in a virtual context, but we'd also love to host them when we're actually able to travel um, at your institution or at cross institution collaborations. And again, we're happy to do them virtually. We're happy to do them in person. Please just contact us if you have an idea and we'll work with you to set something up. Review for the journal. Embrace reviewing opportunities. If you get an, op if you get an invitation to review, please accept it. And then when you accept it, be an excellent reviewer. What do we mean by that? Well, provide DTT reviews, developmental, thorough, and timely. Right? We can track how long it takes for you to accept an invitation, how long it takes for you to rate the, the review, um, and we rate you in terms of the developmental and thoroughness of your review. But all of that is really important information for us because we want to develop you as well. The other thing is we know, and I think every single person who you will be talking to or hearing from today will say, the more you review, the better a reviewer you are, the better an author you will be. So it's in your interest to do a great job of reviewing. And finally, I'd really like to talk to you about this Bridge Reviewer Program. This is something my team and I have been working on and developing. The information is currently not up on the website. We've been a little bit busy with Academy of Management Virtual Conference, so we haven't had an opportunity to update that yet, but it will be, it will be on there. So this program is targeted for individuals who feel maybe a little hesitant to accept a review from AMR or not quite sure what to expect in the process. So if you're not currently in the review pool or even if you are, but you still feel that hesitancy, request to be in the Bridge Reviewer Program. And for all of you participants on here, when this session is over, I will be sending all of you some information on this. So if you are interested, you will know how to sign up. You will give us some information about yourself. And if an article comes in for a manuscript gets submitted and it's related to your topic areas of interest, our associate editor might try and tag you and basically you're like a shadow reviewer. You do a review, you submit your review, but you also get to see all of the feedback and all of the other reviews um, from the associate editor and the other reviewers. So you get a sense of what a review, a good review process really looks like. Your review will not necessarily be sent to the authors, but if you have any insightful comments, they might actually be used by the associate editor. You'll get a chance to get some feedback and you can be certified as having gone through this program in the Manuscript Central um, program. So um, this will become more information about this will be coming, but I'll be sending this out to you and we really hope that you'll take this opportunity to participate. Finally, submit to the journal. Um, we love submissions, so develop the papers that you have to be submitted, but please take the time and effort to develop the best possible paper. Don't just say, oh, well, I wrote this paper for class. I'm just going to go ahead and submit it and get some feedback. Take the time to understand what a good AMR paper looks like, and why not take the extra month to really craft it in that way so that it actually gets sent out for review. So give us your bold ideas, 
craft your paper well and please send them to us. We want our authors to craft novel, groundbreaking theoretical papers. We want you to push the boundaries of our field. And we need diverse new voices to create these bold big ideas so that we have new streams of research. And finally, to change our conversations about organizations. You might say, how do I do that? How can, how can I, as a young scholar, do these types of things? Well, why don't, look around you, look at everything that we've had to do with COVID-19. It's changed the way we think about working. It's changed the way we think about organizations. It's changed the way we think about holding conferences, right? Even that you're sitting here now, possibly in your pajamas, watching this, it's changed the way that we learn. So take that as inspiration for creating some of these big, bold, new ideas and changing the conversations. So on this note, I am going to end here and hand you off to some wonderful scholars who will be able to tell you about some steps you can take to actually write those papers. So I'm gonna end my show and sharing my screen and ask that Cindy Devers um, share her screen and step up to say what she's gonna say. Okay, you can see my slides? Yes. Thank you, Sherry. Hey, this is one of the most favorite things I do every single year. I look forward to it. But typically, I look forward to being at Academy anyway, but we're not there, but we can all be together here. So I just want to take you through some of the, the workshop objectives. Sherry hit on some of these things. I'm going to go into a little more detail about what we're going to do in our presentation and then what we're going to do in the breakout room. So what we want to help you do is write those clear theoretical papers that Sherry was talking about. And so we're going to focus here on structuring a manuscript to really showcase what it gives in terms of a, a theoretical contribution. So we're gonna talk about writing style, we're gonna talk about presentation, we're gonna talk about organizing your manuscript, and then we're gonna hit on some of the challenges and dilemmas in theory building and some ways that you can address these challenges. And then when you get into those breakout rooms with the current and past uh, AMR editors and associate editors, you can go more into detail about what kind of questions you might have specific to you or a paper you're working on or just some some things that you come across in, in your careers. So we'll talk about why papers get rejected, but that's usually pretty clear, particularly at AMR, your associate editor will certainly tell you, your reviewers will certainly tell you. What I love about AMR is that it goes deeper and it focuses on the positive. As Sherry said, developmental reviews and developmental help with authors and papers is critical to AMR. I think everyone that's here that's been an associate editor at AMR has had the experience. I had it again this, early this week where an author wrote to me and thanked me and I had rejected her paper. And she said, <laughs> which is kind of odd, but she said, you know, of course I was, was not happy the paper was rejected, but I got such great feedback from the reviewers and from the whole process that it just, uh, I wanted to tell you that my paper was accepted at another journal this week. And so that's what we look for. We try to help our authors develop their paper, whether it gets into AMR or whether it doesn't. And that's a really important thing. And, and Bell's really done a good job really inculcating that into the culture. And it's great to see that Sherry's going to continue on doing that. So I'll talk about contribution novelty and scope. So I'm back up a little bit and talk about more from a, a broad perspective. Um, what are the key kinds of things that we look for as reviewers and editors? And one is a contribution, two is it novel, and three is a scope good. It, is, it, is it well developed enough, but not too broad or not too incremental? So we'll start out by talking about number one, how do you hook reviewers and readers? Um, whether this is AMR, whether it's theory, whether it's empirical work, whatever, the introduction is the most critical piece of your manuscript. Here we want to know what we don't understand or what we get wrong, what conversations need changing. Or, and by the time we're finished reading your introduction, we should know what you're gonna talk about in terms of now that I've written this paper, what can scholars and practitioners do now that they couldn't do before your paper existed? So it's got to address something that we don't understand or something that we're getting wrong or some conversations that need changing so they're gonna actually take your paper ideas and put them into practice in the real world for scholars and managers, practitioners. The second part here is novelty. 
So, you know, I ask yourself the question, have other people addressed this with different labels? You know, the old, old wine and new bottles, um, cliche. That's, it, many people think that something hasn't been addressed and it's just a different, a different label. So make sure that you understand the literature and understand the contract, constructs that you're drawing on. Um, one of the big red flags for me, and I think many others, is when authors say that they're the first one to do this or the only one that has ever done this. That's a giant red flag for reviewers to go out and find someone else that did it. Um, so you wanna make sure that you are absolutely the first one or the only one to do it if you say that. And you're probably not really the first person that touched on this. So I would just not even say that. But even if you find you are, that's not enough, right? There might be reasons why no one's looked at this topic. It might just be something that's trivial. It might be something that, that no one can test. It might be something that no one really cares about. So make sure that it's novel and it has something in there for scholars and practitioners to change the way they do their work. And again, you have to convince those reviewers and those readers that your work is novel and important. And of course, you're going to think your work is novel and important. You've been working on this paper for years, months, years, multiple years. I've had papers that have worked on for 10 years. Um, so your reviewers are going to spend an afternoon with it. And so they're not going to understand the depth of your paper like you do. And you have to tell them. You know, my, my good friend, Burke Canella, told me something really early in my career. He said, Cindy, you have to hit the reviewers over the head with it. And then you have to hit them over the head with it again. You have to tell us why it's novel, and you have to tell us why it's important. What contribution are you actually making? Third, scope. You really have to mind the scope. It's really hard to swing for the fences and land an epic theory that covers everything in a particular domain. Uh, because you need to be judicious about the, 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 the length of a paper. You've got 40 pages. And so you're thinking about how can I create the depth and explain the mechanism in a way that readers can understand and find useful. And if you're covering too much ground, that's really impossible to do. So you have to be very careful about where you place your boundary conditions. On the other hand, one of the problems that we see is it's really hard to sell an incremental step. If there's a well-established relationship in the literature and it has some moderators in there and you find another one, that's probably not enough for a theoretical paper, you know, and I'm not gonna say it's never enough and there could be those rare situations, but we're looking as Sherry said, for things that are bold, things that are big ideas and things that are gonna move the literature and move what our understanding of what's happening in that particular domain. So you wanna look for the right balance. Those one to two key issues, key research questions that allow you to strike that balance. You know, a Amy Hellman calls this the Goldilocks problem, right? <laughs> it's too big or it's too small, you have to hit that sweet spot where you have enough balance where you can explain it, but it's still novel and it still makes a contribution. And again, develop and write about what you can write about in 40 pages. The other thing that you really wanna do, and this is related to telling reviewers and telling them and telling them again, is to state your research question really clearly. You know what it is, like you said, like I said, you've been working on your paper for, for years. But your reviewers shouldn't have to go on a treasure hunt to find it. So make sure that you really state it out clearly and then actually deliver on it. You want to get to your arguments as, as soon as you can. Obviously, you want to provide the depth and the explanation of your theoretical mechanisms, but you want to get to that straight out. You want to tell us what you're going to do, you want to do it, and then you want to tell us why it's important that we read your paper. And don't overpromise and undersell. And I talked about the importance of introductions. And sometimes I read an introduction, and I'm like, wow, this is gonna be a really cool, great paper. I'm really excited to read it. And then they tell me what they're gonna do in the introduction, and then they never do it. And that's a real letdown, and that paper is likely going to be rejected. Don't overpromise in the introduction, and actually tell us what you're gonna do, and do it. Sometimes this comes up, this, this overpromise undersell or a problem when you have multiple authors. So you have someone who writes an introduction, somebody that writes the body and someone that's right, that writes the discussion, make sure that your paper is one voice. It doesn't mean one person has to write it, but the person who's driving that research has to make sure that it's one voice and it does the things that it's going to say all the way through the paper. So let me uh, think about backing up a little bit. Bell did a survey, I don't know, 
several years ago of ERB members and reviewers, and it was great. And, and she got so much great information and I stole a lot of it. So she had to redo her presentation for today probably. But um, one of the things that, that she found was readers want effortless reading. They want it to be clear. And Belle's gonna talk about clear writing in a few minutes. Um, they want it to be something that's easy to read. And it's gotta be compelling. Again, why is this important? Tell us why it's important and sell us that it's important. It must be coherent and focused. Again, going back to those couple strong messages. One of the, the, the comments from the reviewers that I love that I picked out and I use all the time is this on the slide. Papers that offer a clear and direct compelling story, hook the reader, take them right through on a straightforward journey from beginning to end. Right, so it should be seamless. It should go down the path that takes them from what you said you're gonna do, what you did, and why it's important. And then again, novel and exciting ideas that they can use. Another comment that I liked was that readers can't use your ideas if they don't understand them or if they're buried. Like I said, don't take us on a treasure hunt. Don't make us look for it. Tell us what it is. I'm gonna to start to wrap up here um, with some, some core questions that you can ask yourself as you're writing the manuscript and once you're done. One, critical, is the topic important? Is it interesting? Does it pass a soul wet test? If, if you tell someone about your research and they say, oh, really? Then it probably doesn't pass the soul wet test. Um, and, and even if it is important and interesting, again, you have to sell it as an author. You've got to tell us. You've got to convince us why it's important. Does it create and extend or advance theory in a meaningful way, as Sherry talked about, that's critical with these bold, big ideas that we're looking for? Are there clear implications for future research and practice? So think about implications. You know, what can you do differently with your work now that you've read this paper? This is what a reader is thinking about. Or it may be, well, what can I take from this paper? I might, it might not help my research, but it helps me understand how I can better teach my MBA or my executives in executive education. Maybe I pull something in that paper. Those are meaningful contributions. So think about how you can actually tie those to things that people can actually do once they read your paper. You know, does it contain a well-developed and articulated framework, theoretical framework, or a typology? Is it developed enough? And are the underlying causal mechanisms explained clearly? I mean, that's really important. You can get away with some kind of distal proxies and empirical work sometimes, or, or some, somewhat of a black box, but you can't with theory. You have the opportunity to explain that, and you really have to tie those things together in ways that don't conflict. If you're making multiple arguments one of the pitfalls that I see authors fall into is one argument often contradicts another argument. And again, one voice and make sure those, the, the theoretical mechanisms in your arguments are consistent. A couple others. This is a critical one too that a lot of people don't really pay attention to is the relevant literature used in your paper and are you actor, accurately citing the, the proper work? So Ann Miner told me this a long time ago, Cindy, don't hand wave at theory. You need to be an expert. If you are writing in a particular topic, you need to be an expert because your paper is gonna to go to one, maybe three experts in that domain. And they're going to know if you know the literature and they're gonna know if you've accurately cited the literature and they're, they're, gonna, they're gonna know whether you're using the literature correctly. So make sure that you are the expert. Are your constructs defined clearly? Once you use a construct, the first time define it and then stick with it. What we see a lot of times is what I call a construct soup. Right? Somebody's talking about reputation and sometimes they call it reputation, sometimes they call it status, sometimes they call it celebrity, sometimes they call it legitimacy, sometimes they call it image. It's reputation and it has a distinct definition. So if you're talking about a construct, label it, define it, Tell us why it's important and then stick with it. That's really, really critical. And really then talk about why you've assembled this group of constructs in this paper or you're using this particular construct. And again, don't fall for the new labels for the same old thing. Don't rename an old construct or a construct that's been used in another literature. So sometimes we'll talk about, hey, no one's really looked at this and no one's defined this construct. Well, they have in political science or the have in sociology. Again, that goes back to making sure you're the expert in the domain that you're writing about. 
And, and this, um, this bottom point here is, is really critical. Again, don't hand wave, know the literature, but, but, the, but the very bottom point, avoid errors whether they're typos or whether they're grammatical, your reviewers and your editor are volunteering their time and they expect that you're gonna send them your best product. So make sure, as Sherry said, take that extra month or that extra six months to really refine your paper in a way that it doesn't have those errors and it looks like you made the effort. And I just wanna wrap up here, having a friendly, but not an overly friendly review. Actually, I would encourage you to have multiple not overly friendly reviews is critical because you want someone that's gonna read your paper. You know, a friendly review is someone reads your paper and says, oh, that's really great. That's insightful. I think you should submit it. That's not helpful <laughs> unless it's perfect, which they never are. You want people who are gonna read your paper, who are gonna tell you what's wrong with it who are gonna tell you your theoretical mechanisms are conflicting, who are gonna tell you your constructs aren't defined correctly, who are gonna tell you that I have no idea what contribution you're making or what your research question is, so you can fix those things. And so make sure that you do that. Make sure that you have those types of reviews. And the last thing I'll talk about is a non-academic friendly review. So I, I try to make my papers pass the grandmother test, meaning that when my grandmother was alive, I would I talk to her once a week at least. And she would always say, oh, honey, what are you working on? And I would tell her, and my grandmother was definitely not a scholar. And she, so I could always tell if a paper was going to be good, if she would be like, wow, oh, that's interesting. And she understood it. And so it's really important because if, if you can take your paper and distill it in a way where you can tell someone that's not familiar with the literature what you're doing, then you have a really good handle on it. And so make sure that you can do those types of things, whether that's your spouse, whether it's a friend of yours that's not a scholar, just make it past that, that, that what I call the grandmother test. All right, so next up, we've got Mike Farr, who's gonna talk about structuring the paper. And then we have Belle Reagans, who's gonna talk about clear writing and rewriting. So at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Mike and thank you very much. I'll look forward to seeing you in the breakout room. Great, Cindy, thanks so much. Everyone hear me okay? Cindy, give me a thumbs up. Can you hear me? Great, good. Hey everyone, really great to be here. I appreciate you all taking time across the globe to, to join us. It's a pleasure of mine to have done this for a number of years uh, as an associate editor, um, as, as a participant at the round tables a few years ago. So what I'm gonna do, well, I think a lot of the messages that you hear, that you heard from Cindy and Sherry and we'll hear from Bell will focus around some common themes. So I have, a, I have a few slides to go through as well. You know, please take them as my experiences as an author, a reviewer, and an associate editor. It's not a one size fits all, but I, I think the main theme that will come across here, you know, is the value of clear writing. Like I like to say to my colleagues and co-authors and, and doc students and, and uh, other folks that I work with, you know, this is a really hard process, right? It's, it's a messy process. I mean, social sciences, almost by definition a messy thing and there's a lot of things that you can't control um, but you know one of the things you can control is delivering your message as clearly as you can and again we can have a bit of disagreement on that but we really at amr generally like to focus on the value of clear writing of course you have to show how you contribute to the literature how you're extending it in a meaningful way but in these next couple in these next couple minutes i want to point out a couple things that I've worked on with some of my colleagues and, um, and just some, some tips or thoughts on how I view the, uh, the writing process at AMR. So I'm gonna share my screen now. Let's see here, and it'll just take me a second to get into um, presentation mode. And I know I have to switch it here. There we go. All right, does that look okay? So, great, thank you. Always, always good to get some confirmation. So to start out, uh, you know, David Wetton, uh, 1989, wrote this great paper and, and Bach Rock, and there's, all, there's some great resources on the AMR website, and I encourage you to go to those, you know, over decades about what theory is and about writing and about making a contribution and things of that nature. 
So just to anchor us here a little bit, you know, theory is a statement of concepts and their relationships um, that shows how and why. So the, I want to emphasize here on how and why. And theory is not necessary, is not what is going on. That's your description of what you're trying to do. An important thing to remember, and Cindy alluded to this, is that you can't do everything in a 30 to 40 page paper. All theories, you know, whether we're talking about physics or whether we're talking about social science, all theories have boundaries, assumptions, and constraints. They approximate reality. And so what I want to get across there is I hope is a way to, in essence, relieve the pressure a little bit, is that you can't explain everything, but you want to find a way to take us beyond what we think we currently know in the literature. And that way, I also want to emphasize that you do need to stand on shoulders of giants. You need to make a link for an audience. So there's this great paper um, that I always like to refer to uh, by Hargadon and Douglas in 2001. And within the paper, the paper isn't necessarily always just about Edison and the electric light, but within the paper, they talk about how Edison made the original light bulb a little dimmer than he could have because it helped link folks to this new technology, to the old technology of gaslighting. Because otherwise, as human beings, we rely on our experience. And so if we take that into writing theory, show how you are, that you know what the current literature is, you know, point number one, and then how you're extending it in a meaningful way. And always understand you will have trade-offs between or among generalizability, simplicity, and accuracy. So if we want to get really nerdy here, the Heisenberg principle says the more you zero in on one of them, you know, the less you can zero in on another. So you will be deficient along a given dimension, and reviewers will certainly point that out to you. But try to find the best combination of having a general theory around a given phenomenon. And a lot of times I think you'll have conversations that people will say, oh, you know, you, you can't necessarily be phenomenon driven. I would push back on that and say, as human beings, we're observing phenomena, whether we're reading the Wall Street Journal or reading a book as social scientists. So we observe phenomena and we ask questions around the phenomenon, but we need to use theoretical arguments in explaining why the current literature can't explain this phenomenon or this, this, this new thing in a meaningful way. One piece that I've always really liked that's actually an AMJ is a paper by Pollock and, and Bono in 2013, but it really is about crafting theory. And so if you have a chance, I encourage you to take a look at that. And they talk about the art of storytelling. And uh, Cindy alluded to this a little bit, and, and uh, Bell will also get into it as well. I like to think of crafting an AMR paper is, is really, you know, it's, it's an idealistic statement, but it's you and your pen, right? It's you and, and, and your keyboard, and you're driven by your ability to show how what you are doing, again, I'm going to keep saying this, extending the literature in a meaningful way and in, in, and in a logical way. So as Pollock and Bono, Bono talk about, and as I've said, you should be phenomenon driven, but theoretically motivated. The role of examples is always interesting right so oftentimes in paper so first for amr i think many folks that have published in amr and who are reviewers at amr will want you to use examples to give some concreteness to your abstract arguments so i always encourage you to use examples the tricky thing is and it comes from experience is how you use the examples so if you have too many examples oftentimes you could be criticized or critiqued as theorizing by example one way that may be helpful is as you structure your arguments, if they end up uh, leading to a proposition or if they end up, you know, if they're part of a process model, you should be theoretically motivated again, you know, ex exploring, uh, explicating the mechanisms that you have, and then use the examples perhaps as you lead up to your proposition to help explain what you are explaining here, what, what you are describing theoretically. Another Thing that Pollock and Bono bring up and that I'm also a big proponent of is that you should be able to pick up your paper, read the title, read the section headings, read the propositions, and look at the figure. And there should be a, there should be a strong consistency in the story that you're, ta that you're telling. And that goes back to Cindy's argument about when you comment when you're 
using constructs. Be consistent. Be consistent. And what's in the figure should be in the text. And what's in the text should be in the figure. And your section headings should be able to tell a story by themselves, as should your propositions. And in terms of writing a quote that's always stuck with me, uh, Howard Aldrich came to the University of Maryland when I was a PhD student to give a, a guest talk about writing. And one thing that he said is, you know, don't be done. But that can actually be a relief as well. Like a lot of times we sit down and stare at a computer screen and think we have to write a whole paper in a day or we think we have to write you know, half the paper in a day. You know, how, Howard was very particular about saying, you know, write for a little bit, you know, whether that's 30 minutes or whether that's an hour and do it in chunks. And that's why working with co-authors is so rewarding because there's power in repetition. Don't think that you have to do everything, right? Think that you can do a little bit each day, but stay on it. And the don't be done comment also comes across, which if you do only do it for 30 minutes or if you do only do it for an hour, then you'll be more likely to want to come back to it, right? Instead of saying, oh, man, I have to, you know, you can call it going to the gym phenomenon, phenomenon, right? If you exercise 15 or 20 minutes or a half an hour each day, you're probably more likely to do it almost every day than if you're a twice a week person at the gym where you go for two or three hours and then you're staring at a two or three hour block in your face and you're like, I don't know what I'm going to do. And then uh, one of my quotes that I like to give to colleagues and co-authors is the power of repetition in writing. And that's about storytelling. And you should be able to, at regular intervals, remind the reader what they've done. Cindy alluded to this too. You know, it's the old adage about giving a presentation. You tell them what you're going to do, you do it, and you tell them what you did. Well, the same thing goes for storytelling, in my opinion. I would much rather have a reviewer say to me, hey, you know, you, you told, you alluded back to figure one 10 times, you know, I get it. You know, why don't you cut that out a little bit? Because in that way it says to my, you know, I'm exaggerating a little bit. Uh, that way it says to me that, hey, they got it. Because what they're not going to say is, hey, you never brought me back to figure one. And now I'm lost. They're just going to say that I'm lost. So I encourage you as a writing device to talk, to remind the reader at, at specific intervals, you know, what's happened, like a summary of, of different parts of the paper. The, the, the last part of the, of the presentation here is that Don Lang and I wrote an essay for uh, AMR when we were both associate editors. And, you know, we coalesced around the idea, again, about these things that you can control because, it is, you know, it's tough. It's hard. You know, many of us love writing theory. We love reviewing theory. We love being associate editors for the journal. And so, you know, Don and I had similar views on how, how structuring a paper can make your theorizing come through, you know, the value of clarity, controlling what you can. And, you know, many of us have heard these in different ways, but what we did is we took the opportunity to, to again, give names to these things that, in terms of being more memorable. So, we envision a paper and the great thing about a paper is, is that what you write in the abstract is essentially a summary of the paper that can encompass these five things. What you write in the introduction expands on these five things. And then say you have a five paragraph introduction, which doesn't have to be the way to go, but what we think is a pretty good way to go. Those serve as summaries of, the entire paper. And I'll talk about that in a second. And in another way, if, if, if you buy into this, then it also is, again, this idea of a relief that you don't have to reinvent the wheel every time you're moving into the literature review or every time you're moving into the theory section. So, you know, to, Don, to Don's credit, we came up with these five C's, right? So the common ground, complication, the concern, so the course of action and the contribution. So if we say, how do those actually play out in the paper? I talked about the title in the abstract. Okay, let's talk about the introduction for a second. And again, many, there's been many fantastic papers written on how to write an introduction. You know, we have them on the MR website. AMJ has them too. This is how Don and I, and working with our colleagues, 
have formulated this. So in your first paragraph, you're signaling the audience that you're joining. This is the common ground. You know, this is what we know. Many of us have heard that, what we know, what we don't know. You know how do we contribute? The second paragraph is this complication. So what we don't know, you're problematizing the literature, you know, big fancy word. You're exposing the limitations of the literature. I like to call it with my writing colleague, the however sentence. So we say what we know and then, oh, well, however, yeah, we may know all this and it may be great, but there's some limits that we're trying to expose here. And then that third paragraph is the concern. So why is this important? And I like to call that the in this paper paragraph. So then we start to explain what we're going to do in the paper that essentially exposes the complication in the second paragraph. And then that fourth paragraph, I like to call the specifically paragraph, that's our course of action. What are we actually gonna do specifically to tackle the concern that we raise in paragraph three? And then that fifth paragraph is your contribution. And again, you know, there is, there is more than one right way to do things, right? I don't want to say that we all need to put in a box to be put in a box, but my argument here is that if if most readers of AMR expect a certain structure, then that structure is a hurdle that you can you can better control in a messy review process. So that fifth paragraph, when you talk about your contributions to the paper. And, you know, maybe there's two, maybe there's three, maybe you say the word several, I like to focus around two or three, then you explain how you contribute to the literature. Then those five paragraphs, if this is a structure that resonates with you, those five paragraphs can serve as guides or outlines for you in the rest of the paper. So section two, as we finish our introduction, we move into the literature review which is really a combination, which is really, you know, you're blowing up the what we know part. You're saying, hey, this is the audience that I'm joining. This is the conversation that I'm joining. And if we go back to what Cindy said, you have to be able to show, this is one of the main hurdles of making a theoretical com contribution, meta hurdle one, can you show that you know what the, the existing literature is saying? And then you end that, you end that literature review with the hangups, right? With the limitations, with the problemizations, where does it stop explaining what you need to know? So for, for example, in a recent paper, and you know, it can be as simple as this, in a recent paper that I wrote with two colleagues, Rhonda Rieger and uh, Joyce Wong, we wanted to look at managing crises in the social media era, as opposed to the traditional media era. And our problemization of the literature was simply saying that theory built on how to manage crises has been predicated on traditional media, has been predicated on people reading the newspaper or watching TV and how those stories are delivered. Our, lot, our argument was what that in this new age, in this, you know, in this new context, theory doesn't, existing theory doesn't currently help us explain how firms can manage crises in the social media era. Okay. Section three, you elaborate on the concern. The WWDK is what we don't know. If you have, you know, if you have, if you have a figure, let that figure be your guide throughout that section. The figure should be in lockstep to what you're saying in the section. And then I have a, a little comment here. If you are leading up to propositions, and you don't have to, there's many great ways to develop theory. If you are leading up to propositions. Maybe a good helpful rule of thumb is, is that even within the proposition, that first paragraph kind of re reviews the literature around your argument there. Two to three to four paragraphs is, are your theorizing, and then maybe you end with that example I was talking about to help give some concreteness to your argument. And then finally, your discussion, your contributions paragraph in the pay, in the introduction can serve again as your guide, at least in the first round, for your discussion. You know, full disclaimer: not a huge discussion fan. I'm sure there's some people laughing out there right now. Uh, but at at a minimum, especially in the first round, your discussion should elaborate on the contributions that you make, limitations to your argument, future research directions, and things like that. You know, to review, I would want 
I would want someone to pick up my paper, read the title, read the headings, read the figures, and read the propositions and have a pretty good idea about what's going on. And here's some page suggestions, right? There are many different ways to write a good paper. These are some suggestions that I think have been, been helpful for me. You know, I like shorter introductions, you know, around three pages. You know, they, they could be shorter. I would keep them under five pages. And then your literature review should be a few pages. And then the bulk of your paper should be around, you know, 20 pages. And then a discussion of around five pages. So a couple concluding slides here to be sensitive to everyone's time. Again, control what you can. This is a messy business. It's a, it's a noisy business. But the quickest way to a rejection, I think, is people saying, I just don't know what you're talking about. So in that very last comment there, I said, obfuscating your genius makes it hard for readers, right? I mean, it, we're all dealing with really smart people. All of us, you know, many of us are very smart. I mean, there's uh, purportedly on some scale, right? And so there's not much variance explained there. I just want to emphasize, you know, the more you make an emphasis on clear writing, that's maybe one hurdle that you can control a little bit better than, than the review process. Again, we're talking mid-range theory here, and that's not a sin. That's not a bad word. You know, try to do a couple things well. You know, if you, if you want to do a lot of things, write a book, right? But we're really trying to explain discrete phenomena or a discrete phenomenon in 30 to 40 pages. As Cindy alluded to, please be consistent in your terminology. Again, it's a cheap way for reviewers. And when I say cheap, it's, it's something that you can control, but they can use that against you. And, you know, why let them do that? You know, use the same labels and, and, and phraseology. And then finally, my last comment, and I thank everyone for their time, is, you know, when I'm an editor and a reviewer, these are some of the things that I look for in what I consider an AMR style theoretical contribution. Okay, you have to have logical consistency that can come with clear writing. Maybe some of the things that I mentioned here and that Don and I mentioned in our essay can help. You have to show that you know the current literature, and then you have to show how you extend it in a meaningful way. Sherry said the word meaningful. Cindy said the word meaningful. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bet that that bell says the word meaningful do a couple things well right is your research question novel everything has boundary can every theory has boundary con conditions especially in a 30 page paper it's okay you know acknowledge your boundary conditions respect them understand how they can limit your theory and 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 jump in right if you have propositions i like to say they shouldn't just be descriptions they should be testable you know, that's kind of a North American view of things, and I, and I understand that. Uh, one of our former colleagues, Hugh Corneliuson, wrote a great paper on different types of theorizing. Uh, also, one of the essays that was in our group uh, that will be on the website, process, process theorizing is an exceptional way to theorize. I think typologies are great theoretical vehicles that you can use. And again, this idea of being clear, being parsimonious, right? Say what you're going to say and get out, right? Be logical and be consistent. So I want to thank you for your time. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak, and I look forward to the roundtables and any questions you might have. Next up is Bell. Hi. Okay. Well, welcome, everyone. Let me uh, – this is just fabulous. And I just want to mention, too, that um, – to check out the AMR website, because the From the Editor uh, essays, for example, uh, you know, Mike and Don's at From the Editor essays and others are on the website, and they're tremendous resources for us. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen now. Okay. Okay, so in, I'm just going to take 10 minutes. I'm going to be really quick with this, because I know we want to get into our small groups. But um, I just wanted to say a, a key piece here. We are scholars but we're also writers. Okay. And sometimes we're not trained in the craft of writing. Some of us have had some training or those of us who are English majors or maybe a little more advantage with that, but most of us have not. So this is a craft that we need to learn and it's really critical because people can't understand your ideas or use your ideas 
unless you write clearly. And clear writing is important for everything you write, but it's really critical for theory writing. Okay, this is really, so it's really particularly critical, but it's, this is a skill that you will need um, for all the, the writing that you do. Um, and in particularly in, in our process where you write a paper and then you get an R and R and then um, you have to add all these pieces, but still keep it within a certain page length. Um, you really have to be concise and clear in your writing. So what I'm going to share with you really briefly this morning um, is some information from scholars who specialize in clear writing outside of our field and also um, from reviewers, AMR reviewers, the informal poll. But even as we sh I share the quotes from informal reviewers, I want us to remember that when we write, the audience of the readers, we could think about writing for reviewers and sometimes we think, well, will this get past the reviewers, like they're gatekeepers and whatnot, and we think about that process. But think more broadly. What you write is gonna be there forever. It can make an impact. People can read your work and actually the best articles they print out and they leave on their desk. So you want it to be accessible to the reader. You want to think about the reader. So let me define clear writing really quickly. It's a technique that involves precision. It is a precision, directness, and clarity. It's a commitment. It should lead to nearly effortless reading. There, when you write clearly, the reader should not have to reread any part of the text you've written. And we've all had the experience where we've read an article and you're just like, what the heck? And you have to go back and reread paragraphs. And that's not clear writing. And then what happens is the reader is focusing more on the language, what does this person say, than what you're trying to get across. So you're not doing yourself any favors by doing that. Clear writing from a philosophy, it focuses on the reader. The goal is to engage the reader and bring them with you on your journey. You have your idea. It rejects the assumption, and this is the philosophy, it rejects the assumption that scholarly writing should be esoteric. Our ideas are complex, but we need to present them in clear and accessible ways so people can use them, particularly in the management and organization field, which is very practice oriented. So readers can't use your ideas, and reviewers can't evaluate them unless your writing is clear and accessible. So back in 2012, I did an informal poll. It's from the editor essay. I asked current and past AMR board members, social editors, and editors to share their pet peeves about writing, so why authors engage in these practices, and their advice and recommendations. I received about 100 pages of responses from 67 respondents, and they had 483 years of combined experience reviewing for AMR. So I'm going to be sharing some of their quotes with you, so you're going to kind of hear it right from the horse's mouth. But again, remember that we have multiple horses here, it's not just the reviewers. So the first pet peeve is foggy writing. That's the use of needlessly complex language that obscures meaning. And here's one reviewer said, my biggest pet peeve is when authors hide their thoughts behind opaque language, arcane words and dense sentences. I'm a firm believer that the better one actually knows what one is trying to express, the more simply and clearly one can express it. Another reviewer said, needless complexity, using more than one term for the same concept by showing off with big or oppressive words, okay? So that's the problem. Why do we do this? Um, well, Gunning, who is one of the founding fathers of clear writing, talks about how sometimes we think we need to write to impress rather than express. Um, and one of the reviewers kind of picked up on this and said, perhaps some authors think that the use of more esoteric words makes their manuscript seem more theoretical or deep. I prefer to read articles that use simple language, regardless of how complex the ideas they are trying to convey. Another reason for foggy writing is that the idea is not clear in your mind. And this is kind of an important piece with clear writing. It's an iterative process. When you look at your sentence and look at what you've written, and you think, and you think what am I trying to say here? The process of writing clearly helps you clarify it in your own mind. And then when you're more clear in your own mind, you can write more clearly. So it's this iterative process that happens that's really important and fundamental to not only getting your ideas across, but also developing your ideas. It takes time and it takes effort. There's no shortcuts to it. So the remedies for clear writing, I love this quote by Gunning. 
To write well and simply, you must train your mind to cut through the surface details and get at the bones of your thought. Really get at the bones of your thought. As both Cindy and Mike said, make sure your manuscript is peer reviewed and take the reviews to heart. I would go for three reviewers, friendly reviewers, someone who's in your area of expertise, someone who's in your department, but not in your area of expertise, and then the mom test or the partner test. But the other piece that happens is when you get that feedback, and I would also ask these reviewers, particularly the first two, to give you three reasons why they would reject your manuscript if they were reviewing it blind reviewed. Right? So you get this feedback and sometimes um, your natural reaction, the blocks are, you take it as a critique of your own abilities. You get defensive and you go, well, what, what they didn't understand was such and such. Well, yeah, they didn't understand it, but that's because you weren't clear about writing it. So, you know, you need to go back and really, you know, get the ego out of it and get focus on not about you, but about the reader. It's all about the reader. The other black is we are hopeless romantics. We fall in love with our words and we cut, can't cut them loose. So you go, oh my God, I spent days writing that paragraph. It's so beautiful. I love this. You know, if it's not doing the job, it's on your team. If it's not pulling a, its weight or if it leads off, off astray, or if it's just taking up space, no matter how beautiful it is, cut it cut it it's not wasted time some of the that's a big block we think it's about wasted time but it's not and 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 Zinser really talks about this I love his book rewriting is the essence of writing well it's where the game is won or lost the idea is hard to accept we all have emotional equity in our first draft we can't believe it wasn't born perfect it's all about the rewrite and when you rewrite you cut the clutter here he goes on to say Look for the clutter in your writing and prune it ruthlessly. Be grateful for everything you could throw away. Re-examine each sentence you put on paper. Is every word doing new work? Can any thought be expressed with more economy? Is there anything pompous or pretentious or faddish? I see a lot of pompous, pretentious, faddish writing. Are you hanging on to something useless just because you think it's beautiful? Simplify, simplify. So every sentence should serve a precise purpose and be part of a clear, concise, and compelling story. You only have so much space in your manuscript. Drill down. Every word needs to be scrutinized for meaning, for clarity, and for purpose. And Gunning says, eliminate words that don't say what they mean, don't say anything, or are used merely for display. He goes on to say, resist the mischief of making what you have to say even more complex and telling. So let me give you an example. Academies. Here's this first pair sentence. Our distal language often seems to lie the relevance of our second order theoretical constructs from the proximal parties whose experience we are trying to applicate. And you're going, what does this mean? Okay, so plain English would be, yet yeah, we should recognize that our specialized language tends to distance us from the issues that generated the theories about the phenomenon we are trying to describe and explain in the first place, which is much plainer. And now you have to cut the page lengths. You have to cut the length of your manuscript. So here's where clear writing gets, comes into play. Our specialized language distances us from the phenomenon we are trying to explain. Look at the first, look at the bottom. It's clear writing. It's getting your point across. Okay. Second pet peeve from the reviewer said, read my mind, where, and, we, and both Cindy and Mike talked about it. But the reviewers also said this, you know, where the author loses sight of the reader or doesn't really care about the reader in the first place. So the reader's presented with concepts and jargon and lots of acronyms. It's like, what? so POS incorporates OCB and LMX within the concept of JIP, you know. So why do we do this? Sometimes we're just too close to the material. It's clear in our mind. And we don't have the empathy of perspective taking. We don't put ourselves in the shoe of the readers. And, and Williams and Cullum have really interesting insight into this. They, they said, what we write always seems clearer to us than to our readers because we read into it what we want them to get out of it. And so instead of revising our writing to meet their needs, we call it done the moment it meets ours. So clear writing is really about perspective taking and and really thinking about the reader, not just the reviewers, the readers, the readers who will be reading your paper forever. It's going to be out there forever. So here are some remedies from um, 
from the, the uh, reviewers. Um, jargon should be introduced and the rest should be colloquial words. Leave a paper for a few days and reread it. If you can't understand any sentence, then be assured the reader won't either. Another reviewer said, you know, readability is have, read the paper out loud. This is a great technique. Read your paper out loud. If you start stumbling over sentences and you're finding that the paragraphs don't connect, there's no flow, you're not doing it right, or, and then let your, you know, the mom test. If they have no clue what you're talking about, it's not working. So the last pet peeve, and then you know, we're moving right along. Um, story, story, what's the story? Uh, you know, we want papers at AMR that offer a clear, direct, and compelling story that hook the readers and carry them on a straightforward journey from the beginning to the very end of the manuscript. And, and what the reviewers oftentimes say is, you know, readers are forced to wade through pages of introduction and meandering literature reviews before getting a clear of the core contributions. Instead of being a short story, it's a mystery novel. Okay, and there's a reason for this. And that is, is that sometimes, you know, you are sitting down and you're writing your introduction. Well, what is my contribution? And you're writing, oh, this and this and that. And then you get to, well, what does the literature have to say? And you're writing some more and more and more. And then you're more than halfway through your paper. And then you time, okay, now it's time to present my model and my theory. And it's like, I don't have a lot of space left. So it becomes very underdeveloped because you spent all the front part of your paper teeing up. So when you do that, just cut, cut that first part. It's hard, I know, but you've already done the work and you've gotten the benefit from it because now you're clear on the contributions so you can get to the bones of your thought and um, you've already situated your work in the literature. So you can edit it down to really the core concepts. So, you know, one of the reasons, you know, these muddled and, and fragmented stories, the other piece that happens sometimes is when you're writing, you start at one place and then you find, well, this is cool. And you find yourself on a journey and you end somewhere else. And maybe you find a diamond and that's the journey. And when you find the diamond, well, get rid of the front part because you've already done the work. Focus on the diamond. That's the beautiful part of it. Okay. So sometimes papers need to be written, be written. And when you get the reviews that come in, the friendly reviews, and they go, you know, this really is muddled, or I found this part to be the coolest part. And if you find yourself agreeing with the friendly reviewers and go, yeah, you know, it really is the coolest part, resist the urge to do, I'm just going to tweak it a little bit and see if I can get through, just rewrite it. Don't worry. And as Cindy said, too many cooks in the kitchen, when you parcel it out, you know, you have different voices, you want, need one unifying voice. As Mike talked about in Sydney, you know, you don't want to go for the grand epic theory, you know, and here are some reviewers who say, problemization without this work, what can't we understand? What do we get wrong? Having the clear roadmaps, we talked about this. Uh, review, and here's right from the reviewer's mouths, you know, great papers are often amazingly simple papers, one message, don't create a model of everything. You can't develop a wide sweeping, perfectly generalizable theory in 30 pages. And then the last little quote here is, you know, giving your paper to someone else and say, tell me the story I wrote. And if they go, oh, I really, you know. So then, if, you know, if you have the conversation with them, you know, ask them, what, you know, where did we get off track? Um, and, you know, Zoom's great for that because you can be talking with your friendly reviewers face to face with this. So here are my, my last slide concluding thoughts on clearly. It takes time. It does take time. And there are no shortcuts. And the more complex your idea, the more important and difficult it is to write clearly. But you're going to need to do this sooner or later, either for the first draft that you submit or any kind of revision that comes along. So spend the time and craft a beautiful paper that you're really proud of. Clear writing refines our ideas. I love this quote by Forster. How can I tell what I think until I see what I say? So it's the process. So Sometimes you use copy editors who help you, you know, um, clarify the, the grammatical parts. I don't use copy editors, but some people do. And, and, and I would say, if you do, just hold off on that because that can really shortcut this whole process that's so iterative and so important. Um, it's all about the rewriting. You know, remember, there's no wasted space. In the, don't try to tweak a paper that needs to rewrite. Just rewrite. Uh, and the last is, to find your voice. You know, Sherry talked about needing diverse and inclusive voices and we want the voice. And your voice also is in terms of your style of writing. So you can look to other writers and emulate the work, but only if it fits your voice. And Zinsser says, 
be yourself when you write. Never say anything in writing that you wouldn't comfortably say in a conversation. And remember that when you write, you're having a conversation with your reader. And when your paper is published, that conversation is there forever. So think about your reader and be kind to your reader. And that's how we publish. And that's how we get our work out there. And that's how we make our contribution. Thank you. Thank you so much to Cindy, Mike, and Bell. I hope that you got all of their hundreds of pearls of wisdom. Um, every time I listen to them speak, and I've heard this now many, many times, but I still feel like I learned something and I remember something and I, it helps me in my writing as well. So hopefully you've taken a lot from that.